You know Bundy, you know Gacy, but do you know Rissle? Hello, True Kramers. This is the case of Monty Rissle. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> If you're a fan of the Netflix show Mindhunter, you may have already heard about Monty Rissell, but he isn't exactly a, um, a well-known name in the world of true crime. Uh, he, he doesn't have the prolific standing of, say, a Jeffrey Dahmer or a John Wayne Gacy or a Ted Bundy, but he's just as vile. Monty Ralph Rissell. He was born on November 28th, 1958. He was born in Wellington, Kansas, and pretty much from the get-go, he grew up in a somewhat kind of troubled home. When Monty was just seven years old, his dad uh, just picked up and left the family, uh, pretty much never to be seen from again. By the time he was 12 years old, uh, Monty's mom would have remarried two more times. Not only did he have to go through like not having his actual father there and then having, you know, a few kind of replacement or stepfathers, he then was also basically picked up from Kansas and they moved him across the country uh, because that's what, you know, his mom would do when she met someone new. Later down the road, and this would actually be, I think, mentioned in the show Mindhunter when they were interviewing the character, um, Monty Russell, that Monty believes that if, the, if it had been reversed and that if he had gone instead with his biological father after the, his parents divorced, he feels he may have been something profound, maybe a lawyer, a doctor, you know, something along those lines. He would have been an upstanding citizen, but for some reason, um, he thinks because he was with his mom, he turned out to be, well, the way he turned out. Monty was the youngest of three kids, um, and Monty seemed to be the one that got into the most trouble. I mean, his, his uh, troublemaking skills developed pretty much from age seven or eight years old. When he was 12 years old, he shot one of his cousins with a BB gun. By the time he was about 13 years old, he was already stealing cars. He was committing burglaries. And by the age of 14, he had already sexually assaulted a woman. He was arrested for burglary and also for the sexual assault. And because he was so young, he basically wasn't really put in jail or juvenile hall. He was instead committed to a psychiatric hospital. He was there for less than a year. When he got out, he continued his little crime spree of just doing thefts and assaulting people. And then he would be recommitted to an institution. And in this case, he was there for about a year and a half. And when he was released this time, it was on probation. And at that point, we're into the year 1976. Monty Rissell had a girlfriend for a while. His girlfriend went to college and then she sent him a letter saying, hey, I don't think this is going to work out. So I'm breaking up with you. She broke up with him by letter. He drives up to her school and then he literally sees her with another guy and he gets super pissed. So he gets back into his car and then he drives back to where they were living at this point in Alexandria, Virginia. Alexandria, Virginia is essentially where Monty Rissell would go from burglar to murder. He was in a rage that his girlfriend is now breaking up with him and is also already with another guy. When Monty gets back, he gets to his apartment complex. It's there he sees a 26-year-old neighbor of his, Aura Marina Gabor. She was actually, I guess, a sex worker in the area. He, at the time, is only 17 years old. What he did was he basically took her, uh, essentially kidnapped her, uh, brought her to like a secluded location where he was wanting to sexually assault her. But... He felt that she was being 
too willing that she was okay with having sex with him. He would later go on to say, uh, with regards to this particular um, moment, he said about her, it's like this bitch is trying to control things. He didn't like that. He didn't like that she was allowing this to happen, that she, he felt, he felt that she was enjoying it. So then he dragged her to a nearby ravine where he drowned her and killed her. And then he just, I guess, left her body. And then it would be March of 1977. He was 18 years old. He would commit a second murder. A 22-year-old woman named Ursula Miltenberger, she was, I guess, a, um, she was working as a manager at a local McDonald's. She had just gotten the job. She was living, I guess, near the Hamlet apartments there. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how he came across her, but he did. And he took her to the nearby Fairfax woods where he sexually assaulted her. And then when he was finished, he stabbed her until she was dead. And then he just dumped her body in the woods and went about his day. A month later, he would do it again. 27-year-old Gladys Ross Bradley. She was, she worked at a nearby post office and she also lived in the Hamlet Apartments. It sounds like Monty may have known of her because in this particular situation, he literally just sat outside of her apartment and waited for her to come out of it. When he then kidnapped her, he had taken a knife uh, and he put it to her throat basically to keep her quiet and in order to control her, where he then took her to a nearby wooded area where he sexually assaulted her twice. He then dragged her to the, I guess, nearby creek where he put her head underwater and drowned her until she was dead. And her body was found um, about a day or so later. Right around the same time Gladys was taken, another woman had gone missing. 34-year-old Aletha Bird. She worked at a nearby department store and her family had reported her missing on April 10th, 1977. That was the last time anyone ever actually saw her. Um, but it wouldn't be until a month later uh, that her body would be found in a wooded area. She was also sexually assaulted and had multiple stab wounds. Now, so far, basically, these killings are being attributed to one person, but they weren't like 100% sure either, just because you had two people who were drowned and then you had two people who were stabbed to death. So you had kind of, you had different MOs, uh, kind of, but like their bodies were also found in similar areas. And so it was kind of hard to say whether or not these were being committed by the same person. This was the seventies, even if they collected like, you know, any kind of bodily fluid or DNA, they wouldn't have been able to compare it to anyone or anything. And because these bodies were just sort of left out in the woods and found like, you know, either, either a day later or a month later, there wasn't much physical evidence. Like um, again, the seventies wasn't as technologically advanced as we are now. However, they were able to find one piece of evidence on the vehicle of the second victim, Ursula Miltenberger. They had dusted the car for prints and they found one fingerprint on the handle of her car that did not belong to her. Now at the time, um, you know, you don't, you couldn't just plug a fingerprint into a computer and you'd get a match within, you know, minutes or an hour or whatever. Back then you had to do everything, you know, with the little, uh, that little, uh, that little glass thing, right? They would like, whatever, magnifying glass. I don't know, I'm an idiot. So it took time and you had to like know who exactly to match it up to. It was a lot, a much lengthier process back then. So they didn't have a suspect from the get-go when they had that fingerprint. On May 5th, 1977, there would be a fifth victim. Some would attribute this to being the third victim. I think it's just based on when bodies were found. So this particular woman, I guess, was found uh, third in this process of five bodies. And this was 24-year-old Jeanette McClelland. She worked as a graphics designer proofreader at a place called Brew L Graphics. 
and she also lived in the Hamlet apartments. So now we have at least, I think, three victims who lived in those Hamlet apartments. Her body was found on May 5th, 1977. She was just dumped in a culvert, and this was near Shirley Highway. She had been stabbed 100 times. 100. Just, if you can, try to imagine that. 100 stab wounds. That is... It's insane to me. Um, but they also determined she was sexually assaulted as well. So you've got three victims who were stabbed, and you have two victims who were drowned. They were all sexually assaulted. Their thinking is, at this point, they're probably all the same person, even though there's two different styles of killing. The fact that they're all happening in the same time frame, in the exact same area, these victims are all pretty much from the same apartment complex, this is the same person. Monty Rissell was on their radar. However, during, because all of this happened within like a two and a half month time span, maybe three months, they didn't, and they didn't have like a lot of physical evidence to say Monty was doing this. They just thought, well, he has a history of sexual assault. Um, he's never murdered. He has a criminal history for other things. So he was just mainly on their radar, but through some sleuthing and, you know, basically they decided to essentially um, surveil him for some time. So as they're surveilling him, uh, and, and keep in mind, they didn't have him as like a potential suspect until like a few of these killings in. So when they had that fingerprint first, they didn't have, they weren't like linking him to it from the get go. So they didn't really think to test the fingerprint against his until towards the end of all of this. And so as they're surveilling him, they run his fingerprints that they have on record because of his criminal history against the fingerprint found on the second victim's vehicle. And it was a match. It doesn't prove he killed her. All it proves is that he touched the, her car. But that gave enough probable cause for them to get a warrant to search his apartment once they had that fingerprint link in his apartment well, they found some stolen items. They found Aletha Birds, who was um, the fourth victim in this. They found the keys to her car, her wallet, and uh, her comb in Monty Rissell's apartment. So they brought Monty in for questioning and he just confessed. I wish more people would just confess, you know, just get it over with and do it, but Unfortunately, that's not always the case, but he did. He said, yep, I'm the one who killed all five of these women. So he confirmed that he was the one to kill all five of them. So initially they charged him with five murders. Um, they also charged him with the sexual assaults of all the victims. And they also charged him with multiple counts of abduction slash kidnapping. He had also, um, on top of these five women, if you include the you know the people from when he was 14 years old, he had at least sexually assaulted 12 women total. But because Monty Rissell confessed to the five murders and because he would end up pleading guilty to all five murders, they would end up dropping all other charges. And so the, the judge sentenced him to five consecutive life terms. All of this happened uh, between when he was 17 and 18 years old. He was a kid. Monty was first eligible for parole, believe it or not, um, in 1995, but he was denied. Um, and from that point on, he's allowed to go to a parole hearing every year. Um, but he's been denied every single time. I mean, the chances of him ever getting out slim to nil. Um, so he, he, yeah, I don't think he'll ever be on the streets again. He is currently 64 years old and he is still in the uh, Pocahontas State Correctional Center there in Virginia. And he, so this, this guy was uh, featured on an episode of Mindhunters on Netflix. He was played by the actor Sam Strike. 
So if you don't watch the show Mindhunter, it's it's a uh, it's it's a really good show. It's dark, um, but it's it's definitely worth a watch. And I think this guy was on the first season of the show. But hopefully Monty Rissell will rot away in prison until the day he is dead. One can hope. But that is it for this case, True Crime Maroonies. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube and also over on TikTok. So please subscribe to me here and uh, give me a follow over on TikTok if you want to. Uh, that is in the link tree in the description below of this video. If there's a case you want me to cover, please email me. Uh, the email is also listed below. Uh, just email me the name of the person, where it happened, when it happened, and I will add the name to my list. I pick the cases I cover at random, so I can't tell you when exactly I'll cover that one, but I will eventually. Uh, if you want to support me anyway, we do sell merch like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff and a wine glass. Uh, we do ship internationally, so feel free to do that if you like. Uh, it's in the description below. And then if you have a Discord account and you want to join my Discord server, it's open to anyone. Uh, but please, please be over the age of 18 or else you'll be kicked out of there. Um, but that's also linked below. But that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. I think I may be losing my voice a little bit. Uh, it's all scratchy. Ugh. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> you didn't need to see any of that, but well... Too bad we can't erase things, huh? Too bad I can't edit that out. There's no such thing as editing, so I can't edit all that awkwardness out. Well, this is weird. How do I say goodbye? Schlickplop! Nope, that's not it. Okay. <laughs>